Oh, you believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Ramadan. It is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show. Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing acts which invalidate the fast and acts which are prohibited during the fast. So, Dr. Zakir, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The first real issue and the question that I need to pose to you is can you enunciate or list the things which invalidate the actions which invalidate the fast of Ramadan Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmeen amma abad awuzu billahi minash shaytani rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim rabbi shali sadri wa yassirli amri wa halul uqdatu min lisani yafqahu qawli as far as acts which invalidate the fast, they are listed in the Quran as well as in the Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 187, associate with them, that's your wife, and take whatever Allah gives you from them, that is the offspring, and eat and drink till the white thread of dawn appears different than the black thread and then you fast and complete your fast till the nightfall so here we get the three categories eating drinking and sexual intercourse and there are various other categories which are prohibited in the Sahih Hadith broadly if you list the things that break the fast there are approximately 10 different things which break the fast and you can categorize them into two categories the first category is that which breaks the fast when we take it inside the body. In them, there are four things. The first is eating and drinking. Second is anything that falls in the same category as eating or drinking. Third is taking medicines or pills or injections which are in the form of nourishment or somewhat similar to eating and drinking including blood transfusion. The fourth is somewhat similar to kidney dialysis, where the blood is taken out, it's purified, and some nutrients are put into it and put back. The second category, that which comes out from the body, there are six things in them. Number one is sexual intercourse. Number two is masturbation. Number three is menstruation. Number four is postnatal bleeding. Number five is deliberate vomiting and number six is letting out blood somewhat similar to cupping or something similar to that so in all there are ten things which invalidate the fast of those ten things you've mentioned could you now tell us which is considered to be the most serious and sinful act which invalidates the fast the act which is the most sinful and most serious amongst all of them which invalidated the fast it is sexual intercourse that when you have sexual intercourse and when the two private parts meet then your fast is invalidated whether ejaculation takes place or not and you have to repent for that you have to complete the fast for that day and you have to make it up later and you have to pay a penalty that's kafara 
according to the Sahih Hadith, in which the beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1936, where a man comes to the Prophet and says that I am ruined. Oh Prophet, I am ruined. The Prophet says, what is the matter? The man says, I had sex with my wife while I was fasting. So the Prophet says that, can you free a slave? So the man says, no, I cannot. Then the Prophet asks, can you fast consecutively for two months? Can you fast continuously for 60 days? The man says, no, I cannot. Then the Prophet says that, can you feed 60 poor people? And the man says, no, and the hadith continues. In short, we come to know from this hadith that if any person does a sexual intercourse, it is one of the major sins. It is the most serious and sinful amongst all the things that break the fast. The person who does this sin, he should immediately repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness. He should complete his fast for that day and make up for that fast later on after Ramadan. And he has to pay a penalty. And the penalty we come to know from this hadith is that he either frees a slave if he can, if he does not have the money to free the slave, or he cannot find a slave to free, then he should fast for two consecutive months. Fast for 60 days. If he cannot do that also, then he should at least feed 60 poor people. And these are the three options that have been given for a person to pay as a penalty, as a kafara. But if a person can do the first thing, he should not jump to the second or the third. The first is freeing a slave. If he cannot do that, if he doesn't have the money or cannot find a slave, then he can go to the next option, that is fasting consecutively for 60 days. If he cannot do that, if he is unable to do that, continuously fasting for 60 days, if he fasts for a few days, and then one day he doesn't fast, he should start again. He should fast consecutively for 60 days. If he doesn't have the capacity to do that, then what he can do is he can feed 60 poor people. And each poor person should be fed with approximately half sa. Each sa is equal to three handful of all stretched hand of wheat. So half sa per person, or the food that is there of the land. So 60 poor people you should feed. This is the kafara, the penalty for a person who breaks a fast by having a sexual intercourse. The amount of food, just to clarify that, uh, for my own benefit, if you like, do you think that that's equivalent to about a day's food, approximately? Yes, in short, it should be a day's food that's normal in that land. It may change in America, it may change in UK, it may change in India, but at that time, it was like one of these says that one man requires half sow of meat, and each sow of meat is outstretched, two hands are outstretched, and the amount of wheat that comes in, that's equal to sa. So half of three. The other hadith says that one mud of meat, that is equal to one outstretched hand of wheat. The other hadith says that equivalent to fill a poor man's appetite, you know, in his stomach. So in short, you should feed a poor person, 60 poor people you should feed, approximately what is the food of that land that you should feed him. And if you can't find people in your land who are poor, then you look for the nearest place or? Yes, anyway, and that's difficult in today's world that you cannot find 60 people to feed. I don't know any place in the world where you cannot find 60 people to feed. <laughs> it may not be a locality, but if you just go to the next locality in your city, surely, in your country, surely you can find. I wish to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may that time come. I mean, I mean. Which will come, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Dr. Zakir, which is the second most serious and sinful act which invalidates the fast during Ramadan? The second most serious thing that breaks the fast or invalidates the fast, it is masturbation. And this we get from the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, word number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1894, where the Prophet said that, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, that all the deeds of the son of Adam, are for himself, except for fasting. It's for me, and I will reward him. And further he says that the person, he leaves, he abstains from eating and drinking 
and his desires for my sake. Allah says, the person abstains from eating, drinking and his desires for my sake. Now this desire, from here we come to know, it includes even masturbation. So when a person masturbates or ejaculates, whether by touching his wife or looking at his wife or, or for other reason or looking at any other woman, and if an ejaculation takes place, then the fast gets invalidated. He has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and complete that day of fasting. And he should compensate for this fast, keep this fast later after the Ramadan gets over. But here, there's no kafara. There's no penalty. Because that penalty is only for a sexual intercourse. Here, because the intercourse hasn't taken place, there is no penalty. You should only repent, make up that fast. That fast should complete and then make up for that fast later on. But if a person does not ejaculate, and if there is madhi which comes out, fluid, then the fast does not break. Similarly, this is the prostatic fluid, the madhi. And if the vadi comes out, that is after urination, a white fluid, then too the fast does not break. Only thing he has to do is a stanja. He should uh, wash the private parts and do wudu. The fast does not break. He can complete the fast and continue the fast. I think that would be very useful for a lot of people living in the West and may Allah um, protect us from Amen. following our desires to that level, inshallah. Dr. Zakir, something which seems on the surface of it to be very, very simple, but maybe not. Does eating and drinking, fast fasting, is it considered to be a major sin? Eating and drinking while fasting intentionally, deliberately, is a major sin. If anyone eats intentionally while fasting, it is a major sin. And that person has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has to make up for that fast later on after the Mazramda. And this food, whether it enters through the mouth, nourishment, it breaks the fast. Or if any liquid enters through the nose, that too breaks the fast. According to the Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is mentioned in Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 2360, where the Prophet said that when you're doing wudu, you snuff the water in your nose excessively, except while fasting. This gives the indication that the water enters the nose and it enters the throat and goes into the stomach, that breaks the fast. So, but natural, any drink, any liquid that enters the nose and then goes into the stomach, through the throat, that too invalidates the fast. But if someone eats or drinks unintentionally, out of forgetfulness, then the fast does not break. And this happens many a times, the first few days of Ramadan. People are so used to getting up and eating, you know, and drinking water, going to the kitchen. So the first few days, it does happen with some people that they forget and they have the water or they eat not knowing that they're fasting. So if a person unintentionally or out of forgetfulness drinks or eats, the fast has to be completed, it's not invalidated. This is again according to the Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1933, where the beloved Prophet said that if a person eats or drinks unintentionally, he should complete his fast. And what he has eaten and drunk it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number three, hadith number 2043, as well as 2045. Our beloved Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused my ummah from forgetfulness, from mistakes, and if something is forced on them. If something is done out of mistake, out of forgetfulness, out of compulsion, Allah excuses you. So only intentionally eating and drinking Break the fast, and it's a major sin. Thank goodness for the mercy of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Dr. Zakir, can a person undergo blood transfusion and or accept an injection which nourishes his or her body during the fast? As far as blood transfusion is concerned, it comes in the same category as getting some nourishment. When you transfuse blood into the body. Blood is considered as something of nourishment, something similar to food. Because the food that we eat, it enters the stomach, goes into the bloodstream, and that's what makes up the blood. So when you transfuse blood, it's taken as though it's a sort of nourishment and food entering the body, 
So that breaks the fast. Similarly, if you put any food via the Riles tube into the stomach, that too breaks the fast. If it's parental feeding, it breaks the fast. Or if you inject anything which is in a form of nourishment, then that breaks the fast. Even kidney dialysis, as I mentioned earlier, that if you take out blood from the kidney and you purify it and add into it food nutrients and chemicals and put back into the body, that too breaks the fast. Taking any injection, whether intravenous, whether intramuscular or subcutaneous, if it does not contain nourishment, if it contains the form of nourishment, it breaks the fast. If it's only for medicinal purpose, not containing nourishment, then that does not invalidate the fast and the person can take that. I'm sure that you uh, drew on your uh, knowledge as a medical doctor as well as a doctor of the human soul then. <laughs> it's very useful indeed. Not a dissimilar question in a way, but um, this time it's regarding whether a person can donate something from his body, donate blood in this case. Is that allowed during the fast? When a person donates blood, it's somewhat like cupping. You know, cupping means removing blood from the body to the surface, either by sucking or by cupping. It is somewhat similar. As far as this is concerned, there is difference of opinion among the scholars. Can you donate blood or is cupping allowed while fasting or can a person cup? There's a hadith which is mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2364, where a beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, anyone who cups and gets cupped, they break their fast. Is a person who cups and a person who gets cupped breaks the fast. But there's also another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1938, where it's mentioned that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was cupped while fasting. But because of these two hadiths, there's a difference of opinion in the scholars. There's one group of scholars who say that because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a commandment that the person who gets cupped and the person who cups, he breaks the fast, cupping is prohibited. Blood donation is prohibited. Because the other hadith is an action. The first hadith is a commandment. So when a commandment and action, if it clashes, the commandment has got more value. So based on this, there is a group of scholars who say that blood donation is haram. Amongst these scholars, we have Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, we have Sheikh bin Baz who says that cupping and blood donation is haram. We have the great scholar Sheikh Utaimi who says it's haram. Sheikh Saleh Fozan and Sheikh Jibreen. All of these scholars say cupping is haram. And Sheikh Jibreen says that if a person donates blood, it's like cupping, therefore it's haram. But if he does it to save somebody's life, it is permissible, but yet it breaks the fast and he has to make up for that fast later on. Now there's another group of scholars where Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, he says that the earlier hadith of Abu Dawud, it has been abrogated by the hadith of Sahih Bukhari. Therefore, cupping is allowed and donating blood is allowed. So the second group of scholars who say donating blood is allowed and cupping is allowed while fasting and does not break the fast. We have Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, we have amongst the Sahabat Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, we have Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. We have Imam Malik, we have Imam Shafi. So there's another group of scholars who say that blood donating does not break the fast. So based on this, there are some scholars who say it's makro. Some scholars say that if there's such a large difference of opinion, so if it has to be done, avoid it and do it after sunset. So we have a difference of opinion as far as blood donation is concerned. But as far as the other things are concerned, for example, if there is a small bleeding due to any injury, that does not break the fast. There is no difference of opinion in this. Or if you take blood only for testing, a few ml of blood is removed from the body. For testing, this does not break the fast. Or an injury and a cut, the blood comes out, doesn't break the fast. Or if it's a nosebleed, or bleeding of nose, it doesn't break the fast. Or if it's a minor surgery where little blood flows out, it doesn't break the fast. If excessive blood flows out, in a blood surgery, which is equivalent to blood donation, then it breaks the fast. So as far as the second part is concerned about blood taking out for testing, nosebleed or 
minor bleeding. There is no difference of opinion. All of them agree that this does not break the fast. These are issues which frequently come up in conversations in the UK. And I believe that we've answered quite a few of them there today. So very, very beneficial indeed. In the case of a person who vomits intentionally or unintentionally, is the ruling the same regarding whether or not it invalidates the fast? As far as vomiting is concerned, a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which appears in Tirmidhi, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 720. A beloved Prophet said that anyone who vomits involuntarily, then he should not make up for the fast. But the person who vomits voluntarily, vomits deliberately, then he has to make up for the fast. And the same hadith is repeated in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2374. A beloved prophet said that anyone who vomits suddenly, that means involuntary, suddenly, then he should not atone for it. That means the fast is valid, he should not make up for it. But anyone who vomits deliberately, then he should atone for it. That means he has to make up for that fast later. So if someone vomits unintentionally, the fast is not invalidated. He can complete the fast. But someone vomits deliberately, like putting a finger in his throat and vomiting, or pressing his stomach and vomiting, or purposely smelling something which is very nasty and continues doing that, and then he vomits. Or he looks at something which is undesirable, and he keeps on looking at it continuously and then vomits. So all these come under the act of deliberately vomiting. If you vomit deliberately, then you have to make up for the fast. If it's unintentionally, but if the vomit comes to your mouth and then you again swallow it, that will break the fast. So if the vomit comes out involuntary, let the vomit come out. Don't suppress it. Then the fast is not broken. But if it comes and then you swallow the vomit back into your stomach, that will break the fast. Yes. If you again swallow the vomit which has come out. So the vomit comes out, let the vomit come out involuntary. That will not break the fast. I see. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Dr. Zakir, regarding the situation of a woman who is on her period or menses, um, she is forgiven or she is let off from having to do the prayer and she doesn't have to make up the prayer at a later date, as we've learned in previous series in this uh, show. Um, what is the case with fasting? Is it the same? As far as fasting is concerned, if a lady is having a menstrual period, according to Hadith, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1951, Hadith Aisha, May Allah be pleased with her, who is the wife of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, when she was asked this question, that do we have to make up for the fast or does the fast break while menstruating? So she said that when we used to fast and when we used to have our menstruations during the month of Ramadan, she used to say that during the month of Ramadan, when we had a menstruation, the Prophet asked us to make up for the fast but did not ask us to make up for the salah. So based on the ruling of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was narrated to us by his wife, Adad Aisha, so making up for the prayer is not a requirement, but making up for the fast is a requirement. So if a woman has a menstrual cycle or postnatal bleeding, she cannot continue with the fast. The fast breaks. If she has in between in the day, she'll have to break the fast. Or even if the menstruation starts just a few minutes before sunset, she'll have to break the fast. The fast is not valid. But if menstruation stops just before Fajr, then she can keep the fast. But if the menstruation stops just a few minutes after Fajr, she cannot keep the fast, and she will have to make up the fast later on after Ramadan. The reason why the fasting breaks when a woman has a menstrual period or postnatal bleeding is because a lot of blood flows out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to overburden the woman. So it's a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not want to make it difficult because then blood flows out. And then after that, if you say that you should not take nourishment, you should not take food, it's an overburdening. So because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused the woman that she need not fast, but she has to make up later on.
The reason she has to make up the fast later on, which she does not have to do in Salah, because Salah is supposed to be prayed every day of your life, minimum five times a day. So there's no question once she misses her Salah, maybe for five days, six days, seven days, whatever it is, when will she make up? Because she's supposed to offer Salah every day of her life. But fasting is only compulsory in the month of Ramadan. So if she misses for seven days in the month of Ramadan, she can very well compensate for it after the month of Ramadan is over. Therefore, according to my thinking, according to my understanding, that is the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallam has told that the woman should not make up for her salah if she misses during menstrual period, but she has to make up for the fast which she misses during the Ramadan. Excellent. I think that's uh, cleared that one up as well. And, um, you know, Dr. Zakia, now we've sort of reached the time in the show when we can invite questions from our audience. And of course, we've received literally thousands of questions on these topics. We've categorized them and we've got a list here. Um, so I'd like to fire a few questions at you if you don't mind. Inshallah, it's my pleasure. So Dr. Zakia, first question from the audience is, in the case that after suhoor, a person has inadvertently has some food lodged in their teeth, yes? And as a result of swallowing and the normal processes of saliva around the mouth, the food then is, goes down the esophagus into the stomach, okay? They imbibe it, they take it on. Does this situation mean they have invalidated their fast? And furthermore, just as a, a sort of addendum, what's the situation when a person swallows phlegm or mucus? As far as if a person has some food particles that have got stuck in between the teeth, maybe after suhoor and the fast starts, if there are some food particles which are stuck between the teeth and if the person doesn't realize it, and then, if he swallows it without realizing, then the fall doesn't break. But if the food particles are big enough, which a person can feel it, then he has to spread it out. And unintentionally, if that food particle, after feeling, goes in, inside his throat, then Allah will forgive you. Then the fast will invalidate. But if he can feel it, intentionally if he swallows, then the fast breaks. Unintentionally if he swallows, it does not break. So if there's a particle which is big enough, which can be spat outside, you should spread outside. And furthermore, if suppose the gums bleed, maybe after using the sevak or after brushing the teeth while fasting, so the blood also should be spat out. Unintentionally, if certain blood goes down the throat into the stomach, Allah will forgive you. But intentionally, you should not swallow any part. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, that is about mucus, if it comes from the head, maybe the pan is the sinus, or from the nose, or phlegm, which comes while clearing the throat. If it comes into the throat and goes into the stomach without coming into the mouth, it is quite natural. It happens with many people. The phlegm, the mucus, it comes, gets stuck into the throat, you clear the throat, it goes down into your stomach. It's perfectly fine. It does not invite the fart because that's a natural process. But if it comes into the mouth, it should be spat out. If the mucus of phlegm comes into your mouth, you should spit it out. Unintentionally, if it comes in the mouth and then you swallow it, Allah will forgive you. But intentionally, it should not be swallowed. Okay. Question is from an engineer by profession. And he would like to know uh, whether it's permissible or can he says, can I marry in Ramadan? As far as marrying in the month of Ramadan is concerned, there is no text in the Quran or any say hadith which I know where it is forbidden to marry in the month of Ramadan. A person can marry in any month of the year. But since in Ramadan, he has to abstain, besides abstaining from food and drink, he has to abstain from sexual intercourse. So it depends upon him that when he marries in the month of Ramadan, the lady he marries is a new wife, Mm -hmm. So will he be able to suppress his feeling during the daytime from the beginning of dawn to sunset that will he be able to abstain? That is the test. If he can abstain from any sexual intercourse, then he can marry. But since a person marries 
in the month of Ramadan, it's a new wife, he has to spend time. So therefore, if he has doubts, it's advisable that he delays his marriage after the month of Ramadan and he spends time in the zikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But per se, marrying in the month of Ramadan is not haram. Another question, can a lady, a woman, female, visit a gynecologist to be examined during this month, Ramadan? For a lady to visit a gynecologist while she is fasting, it's not prohibited. But she should take care that the gynecologist she visits should be a lady. Because we have to maintain the hijab. It is not advisable or it's rather haram that she goes to a gen gynecologist. Unless there is no one in that area and she has such a disease which may take a life or it's a serious case, then if she doesn't find a lady gynecologist and she goes to a gen gynecologist, it can be excused as a last resort. But normally she should visit a lady gynecologist. Now when she visits a gynecologist, if an examination is done, it may be a PV as we say in our lingo, medical lingo, that per vaginal examination, whether a finger is inserted in the vagina, that will not break the fast. If any instrument is put in the vagina also, it will not break any fast. For any testing, any examination, or if any vaginal pessary is also put in, in the vagina, that will not break the fast. While she goes to a gynecologist, if there are any other tests done, or if any instrument is put in the uterus, any intrauterine device, or any catheter is put, all these things will not break the fast. Furthermore, if while the gynecologist examines her, and if any testing has to be done, any tube or catheter has to be put in the urethra, that is the urinal passage, all these things will not break the fast because it does not constitute that food or nourishment is being reached. And food and nourishment cannot be given through the vagina, through the urethra, through the uterus. So the scholars are unanimous, agree that she can visit a gynecologist, she can get herself examined, this will not break the fast at all. I'm sure that will be useful for the sister that's asked. Next question. If a person, by profession, deals in riba, or as it's been now translated, interest, does this mean that uh, their fast would not be accepted? As far as riba is concerned, riba is a major sin. It's Gunai Kabira. And riba has been mentioned in the Quran in no less than eight different places. Allah mentions it in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 130, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161. It's mentioned thrice in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 275. It's also mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 276. And also in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278 and 279. And I quote that last verse only. I don't intend giving a speech. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 278 and 279 that give up what remains of your demands of usury. And anyone who does not give up the demands of usury, interest, riba is the Arabic word, if anyone does not give up the demand of interest, then take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. If anyone deals in riba, in interest, in usury, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. It's more serious, it's a bigger sin, than having alcohol. It's a bigger sin than taking drugs because when you have alcohol, when you take drugs, when you have pork, it's a big sin, but Allah and His Rasul will not wage a war against you. But if you involve yourself in riba, whether take or give, both. When you take interest or give interest, both of them are major sins. So if a person is involving in riba, it will not break the fast per se because I've told you things that break the fast, I've already mentioned total 10 things. So this does not come in that, but it's a major sin. A person should abstain throughout his life, especially in the month of Ramadan, which is the month of forgiveness, month of blessing. It will only reduce his reward. What reward he gets for fasting. His fasting will not be nullified. It will not be invalidated, but the reward will be reduced. And as the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, in the Sahih Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1903, the beloved Prophet said, a person does not leave his false actions and false talks. Allah does not require him to leave his drink and eating. The person who does not abstain from doing wrong things, saying wrong things, haram things, Allah does not require him to leave his eating and drinking. So based on this, it is haram. His reward 
for the month of fasting will be reduced. It may be nullified also. SubhanAllah, that's pretty serious, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that there are many people, unfortunately, who are living under this delusion of the safety net of riba that it provides. May Allah protect us from that. Dr. Zakir, next question from one of the viewers. If a person becomes or falls unconscious for a couple of hours, does this break the fast? Unconsciousness per se if it's for a short period of fasting, it does not break the fast. There's an enormous consensus among the shukhs, among Zolma, that if he falls unconscious for a couple of hours or a few minutes during his time of fasting, it does not break the fast. But if he's unconscious right from the beginning of Fajr, before dawn, up to sunset, then his fast is invalid. He'd have to make up for his fast after the month of Ramadan. I see. So a couple of hours during the day doesn't nullify. No the fast. Okay, thank you. Next question. If a person has to eat or drink in order to save his or her life, does that um, mean that they have to make up that fast later on or is it accepted that fast? If a person is dying, as you say, dying of hunger dying. or dying of thirst yes. while fasting, if he feels hungry and thirsty and if he feels that if he does not take something, does not take some food or does not take some water, it will damage some of his organs of the body. If he feels his life is threatened or may cause a major damage to some of his organs, then if he breaks the fast to save his life, it is accepted. Allah will forgive him. But he will have to make up for his fast after the month of Ramadan is over. But if someone finds it hard, difficult to fast because if he's doing a laborious work or he's finding difficulties, he's feeling thirsty, in this case, breaking the fast is a sin. But if he's really dying of hunger, and then if he breaks Allah, I'll forgive him, but let will to make up for the fast later on. Dr. Zakir, some scholars say that smoking is haram. I'd like to know what's your opinion. And does smoking invalidate the fast? As far as smoking is concerned, several years before, when science had an advance that far, most of the scholars used to say that smoking is makroo. Based on the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adhan, hadith number 855, where the Prophet said that anyone who eats garlic or onion, they should stay away from us and stay away from the mosque. The Prophet said that, you know, don't come to the mosque after having garlic or onion because there's bad breath. When you are smoking, the breath is worse than onion or garlic. So based on this hadith, Therefore, garlic and onion doesn't become haram, it becomes makru. So based on this hadith, scholars give the fatwa that smoking is makru. But now, after science has advanced, we have come to know that smoking is nothing but it's a slow poisoning. Tobacco in any form, whether it's smoking, cigarettes, whether beedi, whether tobacco and hookah, whether chewing tobacco, all forms of tobacco contain nicotine and tar. And we know it's nothing but slow poisoning. That is the reason most of the non-Muslims also, they agree that smoking is haram. Not only the Muslim world, even the non-Muslims. That is the reason they put a statutory warning on the cigarette packs. They put a statutory warning saying cigarette smoking is injurious to health. Or in some countries, it mentioned general surgeon's warning or Surgeon General's warning, smoking is injurious to health. And anyone gives the ad, whether in the newspaper, in the magazine or television, it is compulsory that they have to highlight the statement, smoking is injurious to health. So I'm talking about the Muslim world, even the non-Muslim world agrees that smoking is nothing but slow poisoning. And today, according to statistics, the World Health Organization says that every year, more than 4 million people die only because of smoking. And if you count the other forms of tobacco, it will be much more. And today, medical science tells us, and even I had learned when I was doing my medicine in the medical college, that more than 90% of the lung cancer deaths are only due to smoking, whether cigarette or BD or whatever it is. 25% of the cardiovascular deaths are only because of smoking. 70 to 75% of bronchitis and related deaths 
are only because of smoking. Smoking is nothing but slow poison. It blackens your lips, blackens your gums, your fingertips. It damages your lips. It damages your esophagus. It damages your stomach. And it can cause constipation. It can cause loss of appetite. It can cause loss of libido. Your sexual power gets suppressed. It can cause immunity to the drugs you take. And it reduces the defense of your body. And you can only give a talk on why smoking is haram. And I've given the talk on dry tea laws in Islam. And I've covered this topic in detail. Time doesn't permit me here. But based on all these various research, there are today more than 400 fatwas. The majority of the scholars, they agree that smoking is haram. And all form of tobacco is haram. There may be certain scholars of certain countries, including this country where I come from, India. They say it is makru yet. But most of the scholars, otherwise, throughout the world, majority of them, they agree that smoking is haram. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 157, that you follow the prophet, the unlettered prophet who is mentioned in your law and scriptures. And further it says that this prophet asks you to do things which are good for you, tie up for you. So take what he gives it to you, what is lawful and good. And he prohibits things which are khabis, things which are unlawful, things which are bad for you. So what a prophet gives? What he gives you which is good, take. And he prohibits you things which are khabis, unlawful, you have to abstain from it. This is the law. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 195, make not your own hands the cause of your own destruction, indicating that do not kill your own self. Because smoking is nothing but slow poisoning, it comes under this category, something like suicide. Slow poisoning, every puff you take, you reduce your life. So based on this, there are more than 400 fatwas saying that smoking is haram. And furthermore, this is one of the major reasons why it's haram. Furthermore, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 31, eat and drink, but do not be extravagant. Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 26, 27, that do not be extravagant, do not be a spendthrift. For verily, a person who is a spendthrift is a brother of the Satan, is a brother of the devil. And we know that when we smoke, it's nothing but extravagance. It's nothing but taking a pound note, or a few pounds, or taking a dollar note, the green dollar bill, or a pound, and lighting up with fire. When we smoke, when we light the cigarette, it's nothing but burning money, whether it be rupees, whether it be dollars, whether it be pounds, whether it be riyals, it's nothing but extravagance which is haram in Islam. And you can give a list of reasons why it's haram, but just to cut it short, one more reason, that you cannot harm your own neighbor, you cannot harm your own brother. And in smoking, when you exhale out the smoke, it causes more damage to your neighbor. Passive smoking is more dangerous than active smoking. And the person who smokes, when he exhales out, if the person who's a neighbor inhales the smoke, it causes more damage to him than the person who smokes. That's the reason many countries like Singapore, etc., they've banned smoking in public places. In your personal house, you can do it. In public places, in government places, smoking has been banned. So based on this, it's haram. So smoking is haram. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, that does smoking invalidate the fast? Normally when a person smokes, the smoke goes into the lung, but there are some other particles also that go into the stomach. So when we smoke, besides the smoke going into the lungs, it also goes into the stomach and there are some particles, there are some residual things. So all the scholars unanimously agree that smoking does break the fast. It invalidates the fast. So when you are smoking, Besides a person breaking the fast, he's even doing a sin. And that reduces the reward. And many people who are chain smokers, they don't smoke during fasting. But the moment the fast ends, after iftar, they take puffs and they keep on smoking the full night. And astaghfirullah, this again defeats the purpose of fasting, increasing a taqwa. And if a person can abstain from dawn to dusk, from the beginning of dawn, to sunset, very well you can abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. So it's my advice, the chain smoker from Ramadan is a very good time where they can really stop smoking and that will be a permanent part in the life, inshallah, for the future. I mean, inshallah. Dr. Zakir, you just used the term makru. Could you just explain that term for our viewers? I'm sorry. Makru is an Arabic word 
which means discouraged, detestable, discouraged. Discouraged means the scholar says it is discouraged because, you know, onion, garlic, it smells, smoking also smells. That is the reason they say it is discouraged, makroom is discouraged. Okay, that's interesting because often it is uh, portrayed as uh, being a term which is, has positive connotations and not <laughs> negative connotations. I'm sure that that answer, or the answers you've given regarding smoking and the evidence that you've given, and I know that you've got a lot more up your sleeve <laughs> um, to give at a later date, and hopefully we can have a whole program about dealing just with smoking, subhanAllah. I will thank you very much, Dr. Zakir Naik, for those answers and all the answers, alhamdulillah, indeed, that you've given regarding acts that invalidate the fast and acts which are prohibited during the fast. And I've certainly learnt a lot and I know the viewers have as well. Brothers and sisters, very interesting programme, very interesting series. Tell your friends to tune in tomorrow at the same time when we will be discussing acts permitted during the fast. So, same time, tomorrow, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. يومنا صبر ورفق بدموع البائس رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتهو في كل